Welcome back chemists. In this video, we will continue our discussion of light by focusing on electrons and energy. So what happens to electrons when they're exposed to some energy? So after today, you should be able to identify the contributions of Einstein and Bohr to the model of the atom, calculate the energy of an energy level, and explain what the emission spectrum represents. So in 1905, there's Albert Einstein. That's one of my favorite pictures of Albert Einstein. He helped to advance Planck's theory. Remember, Planck came up with the equation that energy is directly related to the frequency of the wave, right? And so he helped to advance Planck's theory by studying what was called the photoelectric effect. And so Albert Einstein shined UV light on a metal and electrons were ejected from that surface of the metal. This is what the photoelectric effect is. And so the explanation that Einstein came up with was that light contains tiny lumps, right? Similar to, again, what Max Planck was talking about, right? That light emits um, particles, right? Almost like little uh, uh, energy packets called quanta. And then um, Einstein denoted the names of these particles to be called photons. So here's an example of what the photoelectric effect looks like. So if you have a metal of some kind, if you expose it to a low frequency light, there's a threshold frequency that you need in order to see electrons be ejected from the surface of a metal. So notice, recall, red light has a larger wavelength, so therefore a smaller frequency, right, and a lower energy. And so because of that fact, we're not going to be able to see electrons ejected from that metal surface at the top there. However, if you were to take higher frequency light, such as blue light in this case, with this particular metal, you would be able to see electrons be ejected because it has met the threshold frequency. So after all we've talked about in terms of light as a wave, a ray, and a particle, what is light? Well, we actually accept multiple definitions, the dual nature of light. And so what we say is that light can act as a wave and light can also act as a stream of particles or photons. So what we say is that light is a collection of particles, photons, moving through space as electromagnetic waves. So we kind of combine the two definitions. So what did this mean for our atom? Well, this was a serious problem that was uncovered because after the discovery of the nucleus, Rutherford argued that accelerating charged particles, such as electrons, emit electromagnetic radiation and they lose energy and should technically collapse into the nucleus, destroying the atom. And so we obviously know that this doesn't occur because matter does not self-destruct. So we needed to come up with another explanation for this phenomenon. And so in comes Bohr. So in 1913, Bohr used Rutherford's and Planck's work to design a model for the hydrogen atom. And you may say, why the hydrogen atom? Well, the reason why is because hydrogen is the most simplistic atom on the periodic table with one proton and one electron. And so as scientists, it's best to start with just the most simplistic model and we can work our way up. So in his model, he had a model where electrons were circling around the nucleus, similar to planets around the sun. And to solve this contradiction, where again, we would propose that electrons technically should collide right into the nucleus, Bohr postulated that an electron could only occupy certain orbits or energy levels. Bohr said that energy is quantized, meaning that electrons can occupy only certain orbits. So you want to think about the n from the principal energy level. This model was also able to explain why hydrogen atoms emit colors when they absorb energy. Now, our focus will be looking at electrons and energy by calculating the energy of a particular energy level. So this is the equation 
This incorporates the Ryberg constant. So E is energy, just like in the energy equation, right? Like E equals H nu. But energy is typically given in joules per atom. Sometimes I'll see um, calculations that omit the atom part. So you could just write it as joules. It's really up to you. The R value is called the Ryberg constant. And so again, similar to Planck's constant, similar to the speed of light, it's always going to be the same thing. H again is Planck's constant. C is the speed of light. And then N is the principal quantum number. Now, if R, H, and C are all the same, then you could really combine them into one whole value. So that's what that 2.178 times 10 to the negative 18 joules is. You may say, what's the negative sign? The negative sign represents the movement of the electron and the energy values associated with it. So we'll be looking at the loss of energy. When it's a negative sign, that usually means that energy is given off. And when it's positive, that means that energy is absorbed. So it really just depends what the question is asking. So here's an example. Calculate the energies of the n equals one states for the hydrogen atom in joules per atom. So this is the equation. Remember that top portion, you can absolutely simplify by having those already multiplied by each other. And then you divide by one squared. When you do that, you get the energy as 2.179 times 10 to the minus 18 joules per atom. Again, it's negative, mostly because we usually take the point of view of this energy being given off. But if you report it as positive, that would be okay too. So this formula can only be used for hydrogen. That's the small caveat here. And the reason why is because it doesn't account for the repulsive forces that occur between multiple electrons or multi-electronic systems. And so you can only use this for hydrogen. This formula absolutely does not work for any other atoms besides hydrogen. So now what's kind of cool about that formula is it helps to predict the energy that's going to be emitted. So when you take an element in the gas phase and you hook it up to some sort of voltage source, it can emit light. And so the thing that's so interesting is that only certain wavelengths of light are emitted. And the wavelength is then what we say pass through something called a prism to separate the lines. So you'll see a, a combination of light, and then when you pass through a prism, you'll see specific lines, and these lines are always going to be the same, which is so cool. Every element has a unique line spectrum. It's almost like the element's fingerprint of an element. So um, you can identify elements from very far away as a result. So you can identify unknown elements, for example, in stars, which is so cool. So... Here is an example of what actually occurs. Um, now, the one thing that I want to point out is if you took white light, believe it or not, white light is really a combination of all the different colors of light. And so that's what you're seeing on the top here. So if you take white light, pass through a prism, like fluorescent light bulbs, any kind of light bulb that you have in your house, that is what you're going to see if you pass it through a prism. But if you take a gas subjected to some sort of high voltage, and pass the light given off from that gas, you're going to see those specific lines. So notice the top is called a continuous line spectrum. And then the bottom lines that you see there is what we call the emission spectrum. So that's the emission spectrum for hydrogen. Now those lines always occur in the same place. Those lines always have the same exact wavelength, the same exact energy. Pretty cool. And so here is some uh, emission spectra information. So what we can do, and you may do a lab on this, um, is we can use something called a spectroscope, which essentially is just like a fancy prism that helps us to determine the lines that are given off. So a prism inside that spectroscope is kind of like um, you'll have an eyepiece and then it's towards the end. This helps us to separate the wavelengths of light given off by the, the gas and then the sun is kind of cool because this represents an absorption spectra. So if you were to look at the sun using a spectroscope, which I don't recommend, the lines indicate where energy is going to be absorbed in that case. So notice again on the top, that's the sun, that's the absorption spectrum. And on the bottom, what you see there is the emission spectrum. 
And so these are for all different elements. So we've got hydrogen, helium, mercury, and uranium. For me, what's always so interesting is looking at the amazing transitions that we see with hydrogen compared to something like uranium. And so all of these lines, believe it or not, represent electrons moving. It represents electrons moving up and back repeatedly. So remember what I said, you can use the emission spectra to, de to detect what um, elements are in stars, right? So this is just such a cool image. So the um, blue that you're seeing is, for example, oxygen. And then the red that you're seeing, let me see what this is. I actually forget. It's been a while, but if you click on this, you can actually see, oh, this is hydrogen. Yeah, pretty neat. So electrons, as I've already mentioned, when they're subjected to energy, they absorb it and they move to an area outside the nucleus. And when they lose that energy, that energy is emitted as light, a photon. This corresponds to a certain frequency of light on the visible spectrum. And that's exactly what we're seeing in stars. That's exactly what we're seeing with those gas discharge tubes. So there are specific vocabulary words that we use to describe what occurs on the particulate level. Um, the first one is ground state. So ground state is referring to an atom where its electrons are in the lowest possible energy state. Okay, the lowest possible energy levels and they're closest to the nucleus. But when those electrons absorb energy, they transition into the excited state. And this is electrons that absorb energy and occupy higher energy levels. So they move further away from the nucleus. It's only when those electrons transition back down from the excited state to the ground state that they emit light. And so this image is showing you, notice how the red line is traveling the shortest distance. However, it's red. And if you know that it's red, obviously that indicates to you, okay, that must mean that it's lower energy. So the shorter the distance traveled, the lower the frequency of energy released from that photon. Whereas the greater the distance traveled, like in the case of that blue line, the further it travels, the higher the energy we're gonna see for our light. So that is it. Now you want to go back to your bell work and revise your answer to the what is light do now and then turn it in. Thank you so much for watching.